<laughs> oh my god, Barbie's <laughs> here! <laughs> Sorry, these are two people who were in a, a previous film, and um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so also, by the way, there, well, no, I'll get to the cafe. Um, so anyway, I had made this film that explored um, sort of the systemic forces around why we have hunger in America and some people who were doing some really innovative things around that. And I found myself in a space where I wanted to just think about what are the issues that have driven me to want to make films in the first place, and that included um, my college years when I studied sociology and specifically um, juvenile justice and specifically spent time getting to understand the juvenile justice system through my work as an intern in a courthouse in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. So, I found myself exploring these issues and I came across an article um, that was in the New Yorker called Hellhole by Dr. Atul Gwanda. I don't know if you've read that, Johnny. Um, he basically described it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long uh, written piece about solitary confinement in which he describes what happens to the human brain and soul when deprived of human contact. Um, and also it referenced the number of people at that time who were in U U.S. prisons in these conditions um, and that was approximately 100,000 people. And I thought, how is it possible that me, I'm someone who cares about these issues, and I didn't know about this? Um, and so at that time in 2012, there was very little coverage in the mainstream um, media about this phenomenon that had been going on for many decades, largely because journalists and storytellers don't generally have access to these places. Um, but at that time, there were a handful of states um, that were um, tackling um, this issue, that were realizing after decades of holding people in solitary confinement that maybe it was time to rethink this. Um, and the Virginia Department of Corrections was one of those states. Um, so I began a series of conversations to answer the question, sorry, the long way around, um, with um, the director of the Department of Corrections about what they were doing in terms of the step-down program that you see in the film. And that in order to you know, understand what they were doing, also I needed to understand or I would need to capture and try and tell the story of what it means to be in um, solitary or segregation, as it's called, in many prisons. Um, and so um, I was given access to come film for what was going to be three days. Um, in fact, exactly three years ago to the day was the first uh, shoot. Um, that took place um, at Red Onion State Prison. And um, eventually, um, because the access was so extraordinary, um, I realized it was a really incredible opportunity and very specifically to tell the story of the men and women, but in this case, men, whose stories are just largely you know, forgotten and ignored. Um, and I had this like incredible both opportunity and responsibility um, that became rather onerous, <laughs> um, but here we are to talk about the, the film, so. And Johnny, I'm so grateful that you're here, I mean, you know, prepping for this, the work that you're doing is amazing, um, so I'd love if you could tell everybody a bit more about that, and also, you know, how you came to make this your life's work. Yes, thanks. Um, <clears throat> thank you for having me, it's pretty exciting to be able to come to the space and, 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 and to talk about the issue. <laughs> Um, as you mentioned, my name is Johnny Perez. I'm based out of New York City. I work for a place called the Urban Justice Center, which is a nonprofit uh, legal services firm that provides pro bono services for people that can't afford it. Um, and we do a lot of work around a, lot of, a number of different issues, but we are also specifically working on uh, solitary confinement. And what we try to do is we really try to change the policies around, around this issue. You know, when you think about it, there are 100,000 people across the country who are locked inside of cells the size of maybe, you know, two parking, two Walmart parking spaces. You know, how I came into the work myself is that I myself experienced solitary. I, I, I was a solitary for three, year, a, 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 three years altogether um, out of a 15-year uh, sentence. Uh, when I was 21, I was sentenced to robbery in first degree and did 13 years out of that. And now I use those, use those experiences to talk to legislators and raise awareness about these issues to try to really change the law. Um, it looks different, solitary looks different ways in different states. You know, it's called by many different names. It might, it might be called, 
you know, administrative segregation, you know, solitary confinement, um, even protective custody sometimes works as a de facto kind of uh, a, a solitary confinement for some, for some people in some states. Um, you know, you're locked in 23 hours a day, you know, just like saw in the film, 23 hours a day, sometimes more at the way that it works in practice if the correctional officer walks by or now or maybe he just doesn't feel like they're getting locked that day. Um, you know, and a lot of people are held there for um, not only weeks and months, but actually years and even decades at a time, you know. Um, unfortunately, we have, we have uh, two states, in, in two states in, in, in the country who, um, where, you know, the age of criminal responsibility is 16 years old, you know. Um, you know, there's also, you know, a solitary confinement for juveniles, you know, for, for kids. We, are, we live in a country where we place uh, kids inside of these kind of um, oppressive spaces. You know, if I if I lock my daughter in the closet for a year because she had a fight or something like that, I'll probably have ACS knocking on my door immediately, um, ready to bring up on criminal charges. Except that we live in a country where we legally do that to kids um, and, and adults, and women, you know. Yeah. yeah. And you know, uh, one thing that was I wanted to know when I watched the film is, do you get any indication? Do the people get any indication of how long they will be kept in solitary confinement when they go in? Yeah, you you get a. Uh, you know, you, you do get sort of like a release date, so to speak. I mean, it's important to people to realize that you don't get sentenced to solitary. So solitary is not part of your sentence. You know, this is an, an administrative remedy that the jail or prison uses to kind of exert their control uh, over the people that are, that are there. You know, um, and yeah, you get a date. You know, for myself, I, uh, the longest time I spent there one time was 10 months. You know, I, um, I tested positive for marijuana and, and I got a year in the box. And look, I'm not promoting like drug use and all like that. There's nothing like getting 15 years uh, in prison that's going to make you want to smoke a joint. And um, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and you say hey, you you're going to get you know let out 10 months from now. But the problem is that in some states, you know, when when you receive misbehavior reports while you're there, that just leads to more back time in solitary. So the way that it looks like in practice, that someone can go there for 90 days for having a fight, but end up there for years because of the misbehavior reports that they received while they were there. And, and if I could add to that, in, in my experience, um, not obviously my own personal experience, but um, just in trying to understand the issue and in meeting and talking to so many people who have been in solitary or sex across the country in various states. So it varies widely, um, but also you know, a, a, a very high percentage of um, people who are held in segregation or solitary confinement are often suffering from some kind of mental illness, um, which makes it more likely that they'll decompose further and, as Johnny said, uh, catch charges, catch more charges while they're in there, making it for some people an indefinite sentence, although on paper it's not indefinite. And, and also, I think it's important to mention um, that, you know, the, the men you saw featured in this film were very specifically chosen to be featured in this film, and largely because um, I feel that often in, in films about the criminal, uh, about prisons or the death penalty, we often focus on people who are seeking exoneration, which are very important stories to tell. Um, but there are also many people inside of our prisons who have committed a crime, and um, I, I believe that we're all humans. Um, and so the, the guys that you've just met had obviously also done something that needed to be handled in some way, um, seriously, and taken seriously inside, inside within the prison system. But many, many people, hundreds, uh, tens of thousands of people, are getting sent every, every day to, to solitary for much more minor disciplinary infractions, perhaps they add up, um, but that's just something that I, that I wanted to, to raise. Yeah, absolutely, so about 40% of the people in solitary are living with some top <laughs> mental illness. Um, and then, you know, you also have, uh, I mean, just I, on, on a global scale, we account for half of the world's isolated prisoners. You know, think about that. You know, I mean, there, there are other, you know, there are other countries that don't even have isolation at all. You know, and, and of course, as an advocate, you know, we don't advocate, we're not advocating for, um, like, you know, that we should hold people accountable. You know, we should definitely hold people accountable. Um, it's something that I would argue that we should not be treating them inhumanely in the course of holding them accountable, so to speak. You know, and, and solitary, you know, when you're there, you're not receiving any kind of programs, whether it's anger management or, you know, educational, uh, 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 you know, any type of educational 
um, resources, you know, or anything that address the problem that got you there in the first place. So we have to ask if that's the most effective way to, you know, uh, uh, you know, to address not only the problem, but also we have to keep in mind that 95% of the people that go to prison are coming back home one day. They're coming back into our society. They're going to be our neighbors, our whatever. You know, we're going to interact with you know with with, with, with people who are returning back into society. So we should keep that in mind while these folks are incarcerated to put them in a place in the best possible position to become productive uh, citizens. You know, you know, we're indirectly like paying for it through our tax dollars. Put it like this: a legislator right now saying that, hey, Johnny Perez wants solitary here or whatever the case may be. You know. And the same way that we can call our legislators and say, hey, we need another park in my community, or whatever you know, people call the legislators for, we can also say, hey, we don't want this happening inside of this state. We don't want people profiteering off the misery of others. We don't want to you know, create more human cages, you know? Um, what a lot of, in my experience, you know, about, I've only been doing this work for about three years, roughly three years. And you know, what I notice time and time again is that the legislators are making policy for people that they have never come in contact with, um, probably will never come in contact with. So by going to them, you know, and talking to them and closing out proximity and saying, hey, you know, I am the mother of, or whatever, well, you know what, I am just a concerned community member, you know, a citizen that, you know, don't think that this is right, you know, and I will not vote for you or whatever the case may be, then you organize. You can have screenings at your school, at your panel, at your church. You know, you can close proximity by writing somebody in solitary and then taking that letter and bringing it right to the legislature. Like, there's different ways you, know, you can get involved. Um, I would suggest going to uh, together23.org, and you know, in every state, the 23rd day of every month, which is about for 23 hours a day, that a person is incarcerated uh, in, in solitary. There's some kind of action going on, and it might be as small as hey, that day people might just Twitter or something about solitary all day. Um, to more public, more public actions like holding sound in front of the governor's office, say hey, we don't want, we don't want you, we don't want this, you know. Um, uh, yeah, if that does that answer your question? And, and also specifically, I, I like you said it a hundred percent, but also specifically seek the corrections unions in your in your in your area and tell them you gotta see this. You gotta start thinking about this. So so yeah.